What's going on everybody? It's Jermaine Wiggins, former tight end for the New England Patriots, and I am here at lovely Gillette Stadium. I hope you are ready for a great webinar brought to you by Leafatech. It's going to be exciting, it's going to be fun, and it's going to be informative. So enjoy it. Welcome everyone that's joined on the live webinar, the Elevate Road and Controlled Effectiveness webinar sponsored by Leafatech. We're live here at Gillette Stadium in Foxborough, Mass. We have about 100 people here uh, in the room. Welcome. Thank you for your time. My name is Charlie Passantino, and I'm the director for the Pest Management Division at Leafatech. On behalf of the company and, and all those in attendance here, we welcome those that have just joined via webinar. It's my opportunity to introduce our, our MC for the next hour. Um, his name is Jermaine Wiggins. He's a former tight end for the New England Patriots. He also played for the Jets, my favorite team, sorry, the Colts, <laughs> the Colts, the Panthers, the Vikings, Jaguars, and the Florida Tuskers. In Super Bowl 36, Jermaine caught the last pass of the game, a six-yard pass from the quarterback Tom Brady to set up uh, kicker Adam Vinatieri's game-winning 48-yard field goal, and the rest is history, uh, a world championship. So without further ado, uh, please welcome Jermaine Wiggy Wiggins. Hey, uh, once again, thanks, guys. I'd like to say not only was it for a championship, but I'd like to say we to start a dynasty that is continuing and is going to continue for a long time. Uh, thanks. It's great to be here. We have some fanta fantastic info to cover. I think... Uh, that John and Ted will give you some motivating and insp inspiring information about how to elevate your road and control efforts. If you act on what you hear today, your, your efforts will be rewarded. Uh, there, there's going to be a Q&A. We'll do that at the end. Submit questions through the online chat window, okay? Um, so I would like to uh, uh, tell you a little bit about our two speakers today. Uh, first is going to be Ted, I was going to call him Teddy Bruschi because his last name looked like Bruschi. I was like, well, I didn't know Teddy Bruschi was here, but it's it's Ted Bruschi, if I'm, I'm getting this correctly. Uh, he's the technical support manager uh, uh, of, of Leafa Tech, brings more than 40 years in professional rodent control experience, starting out his career as a PCO and working in the field. For most of his career, Ted has been in your shoes and knows the problems you face. He, he, he has also been active on several road and control advisory boards, numerous speaking roles at various industry events, and is published in several journals and magazines. Ted is based out of Milwaukee, out of the Milwaukee area. <coughs> Next up, we have John, John Murphy. John Murphy is the Northeast Director of Sales Manager for Leafa Tech, covering everything between Virginia and Maine. He also covers Eastern Canada for the company. He has been in the pest control industry in a variety of positions for his entire career. Like Ted, John has also worked routes as a technician, and, as, and his thoughts and opinions have been captured in different magazine articles, books. John is based in New Jersey. Now I'd like to give these guys a round. Come on. That's me. Thank you. Everybody here at this live event at Gillette Stadium, give yourself a round of applause. All right. And for those of you, those of you that are logged on to the webinar, pat yourself on the back, give yourself a round of applause because folks, we've got 45 states logged on to this today. We've got people from Hawaii, California, all the way across to the Northeast. We've got our friends up in Canada. Also, thank you for logging on. So it's going to be a pretty tight event. We've got an hour, and we're going to touch on some different stuff. Elevate your effectiveness, advanced road and control tactics. How will we do this, and what topics will get us there? Well, Jim Dahl, our marketing manager, Ted Breach, and myself sat down, and we figured, how are we going to do this? We've got 60 minutes. What topic, topic can we bring to the table and let everybody elaborate on? Well, we came up with two words, inspection and resistance. So in this next hour, we're going to talk on products. We're going to give you a heads up on what Leafatech's about. 
but we're going to touch on inspection and resistance. And if I say inspection, you might think of, okay, I picture myself crawling up a ladder with a flashlight and I'm in a drop ceiling. Or I picture myself in a basement crawling around on my hands and knees. And that's the physical aspect of an inspection. Well, what's your mental mind like? What is your mental focus doing when you're doing that inspection? And of course, there's some neat things about resistance that in rodent control, when that word is touched on, everybody's ears seem to tingle a little bit. So there's some thoughts that we're going to run down on this path, and uh, hopefully we'll elabor elaborate a bit on this as well. So Leaf Attack, who are we? Do you want to sit down and listen to Leaf Attack? What are we about? Leaf Attack has a global presence. At Leaf Attack, we are a subsidiary of the Desan Goss Group. Desan Goss develops, manufactures, and markets crop protection, plant nutrition, and pest control solutions. For more than 50 years, Leaf Attack has been dedicated to pest control, and more specifically, rodents, a major sanitary and economic challenge of global proportions. Chlorofacinone, bromodialone, and difethylone, the three main molecules on the global market today for rodenticides, are the direct result of Leaf Attack's research throughout history. Quality is ingrained within our corporate culture. Also, Here's a map of us, Leaf Attack, your representatives. We're here to discuss advanced rodent control tactics, but making Leaf Attack your partner in product selection is one tactic. We have our representatives throughout the country. Crystal Angle in the Midwest, Ray White, North Central Region, Sean Jurassic is in the Southeast, Larry King is on the West Coast, and Craig Manson also is in the South Central area. I'd like to give a shout out to Larry King, because those of you who know him, those of you who may not, but Larry has been uh, representing Leaf Attack for over a decade. And in about a month, Larry King's going to retire. So those of you who know him, whether you're out on the West Coast, give him a call, pat him on the back, congratulate him. But I'm also here to announce that should any of you know of anybody that would like to be a candidate to maybe apply for a position at Leaf Attack, that West Coast position is open. So just get in touch with pa Charlie Pazentino. There's his email. Send him all the information you can come up with. So... Inspection. How are we going to touch on this? Just like I said during my introduction, are we ready to inspect, to get physical, but then also to maybe grasp this in a mental form? This is my quote from a book. You always have to think beyond the structure. Think about what is going on underneath and all around, because that is where the rats are located. The more you look into it, the more you will most likely find. That is from a book entitled Rats, written by Robert Sullivan. But what I'm trying to say here, folks, is look at the structure. It could be a barn. It could be a building. It could be a school, anything. It could be just a sewer line. But look at it and study it and get a feeling for it. How can we have an event at Gillette Stadium and create an analogy of football and rodent control without mentioning the great Vince Lombardi? The price of success is hard work dedication to the job at hand, and the determination that whether we win or lose, we have applied the best of ourselves to the task at hand. We work hard. We may not solve the problem on the first inspection. It might take the second or the third, but when we show up, we are prepared to do it and to do it at the best we can. Does anybody hunt or fish? We enjoy that, don't we? Does anybody hunt for rodents? Do you fish for rodents? A hunter studies the landscape and reads the weather. The fisherman examines and grasps the water. How is the current moving? What is the tide like? Do we match the hatch? Meaning, what are they feeding on? Solving rodent issues takes planning. When the big game is approaching, you take the time to study the opposing team. It's preparation. Once again, we're hunting for these critters. These are animals. But we have to go into those accounts and solve those problems in a very prepared state. Rodent highways. I'm showing you a picture here. Think about it. Not every part of that account you actually can see, let alone have access to. This slide is showing you a drop ceiling and a group of office cubicle workstations before they have been fully assembled. Just in that little slide right there, you're looking at a bunch of different runways. If a mouse gets into a workstation cubicle, that's like a mouse hanging out in Disney World. And his name doesn't have to be Mickey. But that's a joy for that little guy. He's going to hide in there and he's going to live and he's going to grow. 
Drop ceilings, raised flooring should all be inspected and monitored. These areas are only a tidbit of where a rodent will go and hide, whether it's a crawl space, a raised floor. All these areas eventually in an account need to be inspected, need to be monitored. You may not have to get there on every single visit, but can you take the time every once in a while to put it on a schedule and get into these void areas? Because that's where the rodents will be. Bless you. Think three-dimensionally. Be sure to look beyond what you can see with your eyes. You need to use your x-ray vision. What are the walls made out of? What are these walls right here in this room? Are they drywall? Is it hollow cement block? What is in the ceiling? By envisioning these other areas, you will gain a better understanding of the terrain that you will be rodent hunting throughout. It doesn't take much time to stand at that account and look at that structure. Look at that crawl space. Look at that wall and try to envision what those rodents are doing in those void areas. Look high and low. If you're only looking down, you're missing a lot. Mice can be up high, rats too. Roof rats are becoming more prevalent these days in certain areas. Do you ask the question, why? If I've got three mice in a catch-all trap in an account, that's great. I could pat myself on the back and I say, wow, I just caught these guys. But do you actually take the time to say, why are they here to begin with? If there's a rat on a glue board in the account, why is the rat here? I know I caught it and that's great, but I still have to figure out why. Because if I'm here to protect this account and keep rodents out, I don't want them in. And I want to understand why they got in here to begin with. When rodents are comfortable and established, they will adapt. They will travel high and low to attain their goals. The textbook says that the Norway rat is a ground dweller. It loves to live in the dirt. Well, if that Norway rat is in a warehouse eating whatever you want, cookies, chips, and that food is about 10 feet off the floor, that's fine. He'll get to it. If you move that food to 60 feet, he'll go find it. doesn't matter. They will adapt. How can we find rats 40 stories up in a skyscraper when they're supposed to live in the soil? How can we find them 100 stories up in a skyscraper? They will adapt. The more comfortable they get, the more comfortable they are, and they will adapt and grow in an infestation. I'm here to discuss a case story. We're talking about inspections. So you've got a restaurant, typical classic pub, in a very heavy urban environment. Pest control company calls, and I, this picture is not really digital because this was taken way back in 1997. So that was just with a box camera from probably Walmart or something. All right, But think about it. Pest control company calls and says, look, John, I've got these rats in this kitchen. Continually, the rats show up in the basement also. <coughs> so we go in the kitchen and we see rat activity. I go in the basement and I see rat activity. But then as we move stuff around in that basement, I see a hatch in the floor. I open that hatch in the floor and I stick my head down there and it's a very dark, damp crawl space. Lots of cobwebs. And I see rats scurrying around. So I choose to jump down in that crawl space. And I see another hatch. And I open that hatch. And I stick my head down there. And it's even darker. More cobwebs. And some more rats running around. So yes, I jumped down that level too. And when I got to the second, then I found a third. And then that third level, not only were there more rodents, but there was also a, an air current that was coming out of the left corner of this dark, damp crawl space. To make the long story short, this pub, this restaurant, this establishment has been there many years. Do we remember prohibition days? Well, they would bring the product up from the river because that's where their tunnel led to. And the product would be brought up the tunnel to the different levels underneath the pub, the bar. Nobody ever sealed that up all these years. Now, the pest control company doesn't go there every visit to go down those different levels and bait and trap, etc. But every three months, somebody, one technician or another, draws the straw to go down that deep and to monitor it and check it. The pest control company still has that service with that account since 1997 today. There's no rats in that account. But by looking and sniffing and crawling and digging, there's other ways. We cannot find every access point, but the rodent will find that access point. And sooner or later, they're going to infringe on our area, get into our accounts, and our goal is to sniff them out and find them. 
What I'm going to do now is bring up Ted, and Ted's going to touch on some toys. Thank you, John. <clears throat> okay. Hello, fellow rat killers. <laughs> um, I've uh, I, I had the the great fortune early in my career to work for uh, Bill Jackson out of Bowling Green University, and uh, he's the guy that uh, that kind of got me started in uh, in the working with rats and and later mice. But boy, rats are my favorite. Um, we're going to spend just a few minutes here talking about uh, inspection tools and. Um, uh, you know, John spoke of x-ray vision and, uh, you know, being able to see or, or you know, see inside of walls and, and uh, ceilings and crawl spaces and all those out-of-the-way places. Um, so we're going to talk about those, uh, some tools we can use for that purpose. Uh, I want to mention just first, you know, we've all got the, the usual inspection tools, the, the flashlight, uh, knee pads. Um, one that often gets left behind when we head out to an inspection is a ladder. Uh, these animals are highly mobile, and we really need to make sure that we've got ways of getting into those those high and low places. <clears throat> Additionally, I have uh, three kind of high tech tools in my toolkit these days, and uh, we're going to talk about uh, about those things in a little bit of detail here, because they give me that uh, that superhuman sense uh, to get into things. The first one is a probe camera, <clears throat> and um, you know, it's, there, there's a whole bunch of them on the market, but basically these tools uh, can enable you to see inside of voids. Um, as with all tools, you pay for what you get. You know, right now there are um, there are probe cameras on the market for less than a hundred bucks. Um, most of those are meant more like toys than real tools, but uh, uh, there's some some good ones out there for for maybe two hundred and fifty or three hundred dollars. Um, a good one will also help you document what you see, okay? Not just help you see it, but uh, to document it. Um, I have several features that I like that I'm looking for in a camera. Uh, the first one is a large screen so that I don't have to squint to see what I'm looking at, uh, especially now that I'm getting older and the vision is going to pot. Um, Built-in light source because many of the places you're going to be looking are going to need to, uh, you're going to need uh, extra light. This one has uh, a little LED light right in the tip of the lens. Um, the ability to capture photos, you know, when I've got that uh, that photo on the right, it was taken with uh, with this probe camera, and we'll get into the photo in just a minute. Um, and then the ability to adjust the image right side up, because as you're doing this, working with this tool, um, you're going to be turning yourself upside down, and you're going to be turning the, the the device around various directions, and all of a sudden that you're you're wondering, what am I looking at here? You know, what which way is up? And uh, this, uh, this camera has uh, just a button that you can push, and it will rotate that lens around until, or the image around, so that it at least looks right side up. Okay. Now this picture, when you're looking at that up in the upper left, that fuzzy looking stuff up there, that's great stuff that somebody put in from, uh, from the other side of the wall. And then when you come down into the middle of that picture, uh, you'll see there's kind of a black line running across. That's a piece of white electrical wire that the mice have been running open over so often that it's, it's black from their, their smear. And then below that, uh, there's a kind of a fuzzy black line there. That's a place where the mice have been running up over the, the, uh, the, the concrete block and leaving their, their rub marks behind. Uh, this picture was actually taken up through a ceiling, a hole in the ceiling, and then horizontally into this, uh, this void. And then the thing that got the, uh, the attention of the, uh, the, the facility manager was if you look at that wire, you can see that it's white and then it's black. And in the middle, the rodents have chewed the, the insulation off. There's no insulation for about a half inch in the middle of that wire. Um, there's, um, okay, I think I've covered everything on that one. The next tool that I want to talk about is, is trail cameras, and these things are are becoming increasingly value, valuable to me and to a lot of other people. Um, they're very useful for identifying the critters that are are getting into your facility or that are already in the facility. You know, what have I got running around in here? Um, you can use them to to confirm the presence of rodents. Maybe somebody, maybe you think there's something here, but you're not sure. Uh, a trail camera can tell you 
you know, what you've got and what time they're moving around. Uh, the things that you want to look for in a, in a trail camera, first of all, is, uh, is a fast trigger speed. Okay, you're going to set this camera so it's facing forward, and you're going to depend on something to run in front of this. And if, uh, if the trigger is too slow, it's a digital camera, if the trigger is too slow, by the time the critter, uh, by the time the camera fires, the critter's already gone. And all you've got is a date stamp. Um, so this one has a, a quarter second trigger speed, which is pretty, pretty uh, quick for a digital camera. Then the other thing is infrared flash. This is a, a flash on the front of the camera. And this one fires or, or uh, is infrared, meaning a human can't see it. And probably rodents can't see it either. It doesn't really matter to them in the first place. But what that means to you is if you put this camera someplace like in a dark alley, um, it's probably still going to be there in the morning because of the white light flash going off at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning didn't attract attention to it uh, from somebody that, uh, that wanted to pick up a few extra bucks uh, selling your camera. Um, if you look at that image on the right, what you're looking at, there's a couple of things about this image. Number one, I know for sure now that I've got roof rats. This is a poultry operation. Uh, you can tell by the long tails on the, on the critters. Uh, beyond that, this is an infestation that's pretty heavy because I've got roof rats feeding down on the floor rather than on the feeders that are, that are six or eight feet above the floor. So I've got quite a few, you know, I've got critters on the floor that were pushed down there by the more dominant animals. And then finally, electronic rodent monitoring is coming. In fact, it's here. Um, and, uh, you know, Leafa Tech and Dow Agro Sciences have been working together for several years now to, uh, to develop an electronic rodent monitoring system. And uh, we've got one that's called Active Sense. Um, it will be on the market real soon. The parts are being manufactured right now. Basically, it consists of multiple sensors, and the sensor is this piece over here on, the, on your left with the little antenna on it. And uh, the system can be tailored to fit your account. So it can be tailored to, to work in, a, say, example, a, a fast food restaurant, something that small, or you can, you can ramp it up to a, to a major food plant, uh, depending on how many sensors you need and how you want to use this, the system. These sensors will detect a, a tripped trap. So in other words, you can use them with a snap trap, either a mouse or a rat trap, until uh, if that trap is, is gone before you ever, ever have to get into the truck. Um, it will tell you if there's rodents in a multiple catch trap. It will tell you if rodents have been visiting a bait station. So if you're setting up a new account, for example, and uh, you're putting bait stations out and you want to know if you're getting hits there, if you need to go back and restock bait stations before your next scheduled trip, you can know that. Uh, without ever having to go there and look. The data is, is uh, captured from the sensors. It's transmitted to a, to a base station. From there, it goes to one of those big computers in the cloud. Um, and then from there, you can download that data with a, with a desktop PC, a tablet PC, a laptop, uh, even a smartphone. If you want more information, just contact your, uh, your local Le uh, LIFA tech rep. Okay, now we're going to shift gears a little bit here. We talked a little bit about, uh, as John mentioned, resistance. And we've kind of broken this down into uh, to four types that we're going to talk about today. Uh, two of those are related to rodents, and two of those are related to rodent control professionals. Uh, I'm going to talk about the ones related to rodents, and John will, will address the other two. In rodents, true resistance is a genetic change in their biology that's brought on by a, a long history of, of a particular harm that they encounter. Okay, something, something is, is, uh, is hurting these guys and uh, some critters survive that better than others. Probably due to some sort of a quirk in their biology, it helps them survive that harm and then those survivors breed more of the same. And over time, the cork becomes normal and your problem uh, gets bigger, okay? Control gets more difficult. Okay, let's talk first about what I call metabolic resistance. And there's a number of names for, for this, but basically uh, resistant rodents have evolved to be able to tolerate more of a particular rodenticide 
than, than some of their brethren, okay, and their ancestors. They, in turn, breed more resistant rodents, and again, the problem gets worse. Europe right now is fighting resistance to multiple rodenticides, multiple, multiple anticoagulant rodenticides. Um, and they've, uh, they've identified the, uh, the genes responsible for much of those, those resistance problems. To prevent resistance problems in the U.S., there's some things that we need to do. The first thing is aggressively attack any infestations. The, the, uh, the thing that, uh, that helps resistance problems get worse is kind of a, a half-hearted attempt at rodent control with rodenticides. Uh, you need to really be aggressive with it. And one of the ways that you can do that is to use a product that's highly palatable, something that they're going to eat quickly and they're going to eat enough of it. Um, and then you got to make sure that you've got an uninterrupted supply because, uh, you know, otherwise uh, you've got some critters in that population that aren't going to get a dose. Their buddies ate it all. And, uh, yeah, maybe they're dead, but uh, these other guys are still running around. Keep in mind that dead rodents don't pass on resistance genes. Kill them and then the problem is solved. Okay. I think we're back to you, aren't we? I think you have one more. Do I? Mm, I think we, oh, the behavior, what happened here? Huh. Okay, all right, I'm going to have to do it, uh, wing it. Behavioral resistance um, is, uh, is, is a situation that occurs when you have an animal that does not like a particular flavor or uh, nutritional balance. So you've got, uh, uh, for example, a rat that doesn't like the taste of product A. And uh, there's something just in his makeup. Um, in Europe, they had some situations where uh, rats and mice weren't uh, eating carbohydrate-based rodenticides. Same thing we ran into with cockroaches and uh, carbohydrate-based uh, versus protein-based. And then what they ended up doing over there is switching to a protein-based rodenticide in order to solve the problem. But it's basically the same thing. It's just that, that the cork is not, um, it's not an ability for them to, to tolerate the rodenticide. They just don't get it in the first place because they don't eat it. So <clears throat> the way you can work around that is by making sure that you've got multiple tools in your toolkit, uh, multiple you know, traps and rodenticides. Uh, don't try to do rodent control with just the same thing all the time. What I usually suggest to technicians is, if they've, they're doing a, um, a kind of a clean-out situation and you're going in with product A and it's working pretty good and then all of a sudden feeding stops and you, you, you think you maybe got them all but you're not quite 100% sure, switch to a product B for a little while and see if all of a sudden you've got some critters that take that. That might, you, you know, you might have a few animals that don't, don't like product A and now you've got them with product B. So, now I'm done. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. Thanks, Ted. Everybody doing well? Yeah. All right. Hey. Technician resistance. What do we mean by this? Technicians are subject to pressures which could impede upon their success. You need to inspect first. If you attack first, you're not going to solve the problem. Anybody could be a great glue board applicator, but you're not going to solve problems. You'll harvest some rodents. But once again, the pressure will still be there. Rodent control cannot be solved just by using a tape measure. Distance is for beginners. Oh, I need to put my bait stations every 20 feet, every 15 feet. That's great. But that ruler is not going to solve the problem. We want you to go beyond that. Why does the label say, just like Ted mentioned, to keep an uninterrupted supply of bait for days? Because you can't kill rodents if there isn't any bait left. Underbaiting is the number one problem we see, especially in new accounts with infestations. You may need to visit these accounts more frequently, in the beginning especially. But understanding that when using rodenticides, you are trying to, recre trying to create a recurrent feeding pattern. We want them to keep coming back. The product still needs to be there. That pressure or that resistance that that technician might get can also be from the account itself, which we know. Sanitation could be forgotten about. 
holes could be all over the place. But once again, that's where that individual needs to step up the game. If I can't get the whole seals, if I can't get sanitation to be where it should be, but I'm still expected to kill rodents, then I have to change the game a little bit. What a pest management professional looks like. Here's George. George is an actor. And if you get our literature from Leaf Attack, you're going to see George a lot. He's in a lot of our cell sheets. He's pretty. He's pretty. All right. George listening today? But now maybe George is walking into a residential account. Maybe he's going into a hospital at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. So he's all right. He's neat. But that doesn't look like a rodent hunter that just finished eight hours of work. Now, here's a photo of Ted after working on a rodent job in a crawl space. Now, here's someone that isn't afraid to get dirty to solve problems. Could have been his prom picture, but that's Ted working, and that's getting dirty. If somebody worked for me for eight hours and came back at the end of the day and the shirt was still tucked in and everything was fine, I don't think you did those rodent jobs that we had coming up for you. So here's what I want you to do. I want to see you looking like Ted. In fact, send me your post-rodent job photos, the dirtiest, filthy photos of you once you've conquered a rodent job. Send these photos to the email address on the screen by June 1st, 2016. The best photo, which should include a Leafa Tech product, received by then will get a Stinger rechargeable flashlight. It's valued about $100. So once again, send us your dirty photos, and we'll see who's going to win a flashlight. Profitability resistance. You're not running a nonprofit company. We know that. You're in business to make money. We all know there's a lot of competition out there, sometimes too much competition. And frequently the job goes to the lowest bidder. But be sure to price the job the right way. If you bid too low, you may get the job, but you won't be in a position to do a quality job. Short-term success, long-term failure. I know that it's extremely easy to talk about, but been there and done that. Once again, especially if you pick up an account and you're going to go in at a certain price, but you realize I might have to come here now for 10 days in a row just to solve this rodent problem. Well, then I hope it was priced right because you need to make a buck on it. So maybe I've got a customer. Maybe this customer build these, builds these beautiful buildings, all quality, top A buildings. And I have those buildings and I service them at the price I want. But I also provide a phenomenal service to this person. Well, now that company builds some other buildings, maybe lesser quality. He says, well, we want you to do those buildings. What's your price? Well, here's my price. No, you have to come in less. I can't come in less because this is the way we operate. This is the quality we give you, and that's the number. No, you have to cut down. you got to be cheaper. No, because if I'm cheaper, I'm not going to give you the service you expect, and then you're probably going to hate me for it. I don't lose the A building. They still love me on the A buildings, but I didn't pick up that extra work. I'll find other work. But once again, it just comes down sometimes to profitability. Sometimes we need to walk away if we're not going to get the right price for it. Because some people think all we do is show up with that black little bait station, put about 20 around that account, and problems should be solved. And it doesn't work out that way. Just because you show up with a bait station, you're not going to get rid of your rodents. So in summary, resistance. Rodent resistance is rarely the issue. Most often it is resistant to efficient and aggressive rodent control. Resistance should not be an excuse. By performing a thorough inspection and understanding how commensal rodents travel and behave, you will overcome obstacles. The goal is not to have these rodents reproduce you out of that account. Take the fight to them. Understand the basic bio behavior and biology and understand that those mice, those rats, will reproduce you out of that account if you do not increase frequency of service, frequency of material, and really literally just take the fight to them. Evolution of everything. Everything evolves. We evolve. Products are evolving. Standing still is like going backwards because everything is changing. Everything is evolving. Computers replacing typewriters. LEDs replacing light bulbs. Wikipedia is replacing 60-pound traditional encyclopedias. The fancy term is disruptive innovation. Well, I call it getting and staying ahead. Ask yourself, have you changed your adenoside selection in the last 10 to 15 years? Have you refined and improved your baiting strategies lately? And have you evolved? Have you grown? Have you changed? 
Bait stations. Those are our Aegis bait stations from Leaf Attack. Bait stations have evolved. That plastic box has come a long way. There was a time when bait stations weren't even prevalent. They were just a simple black plastic box. But now they're designed to be fast to open, designed to encourage rodent entry with a see-through design, designed with easy cleanup in mind, and the ability to bait and to trap. And who would have thought that bait stations today would actually come with concrete already attached? But that's what the HSRP anchor is. It's a 12-pound block already attached to a bait station. Once you buy them, if you buy them by the pallet, Leaf and Tech will actually ship you the pallet for free. It's right to the account if you need it. So once again, things change, things evolve. The evolution of rodenticides. There was a time when you didn't buy a bucket of mini blocks. There was a time when you bought concentrate and you went down to the basement or if you went in the garage or the shed and you mixed your own stuff. You took fish, you took bird seed, and you mixed some wacky concoctions. And I'm sure there's folks listening today or right here live that you've got some great recipes on what you used to mix and kill rodents. But those days are pretty much behind us. But think about the evolution from tracking powders and liquid baits. Think about pelletized baits back in the 70s. Manufacturers gave you these large pellet baits, and you went out and you put it for rats. Rats would ingest it. But then all of a sudden, wow, mice, they're hoarding it. They're translocating these pellets everywhere. Well, then the industry decides to take the pellets, and grind it up to like a powder, and add seeds to it. And we call it meal bait. And meal bait worked for years for mice control. Well, then from that to bulk baits, bulk pellet, bulk meal, we get what was once called a toss pack. And you took these packs and you tossed them everywhere. Well, some folks didn't like that, so we call them now place packs. Pretty soon, they'll be gentle place packs. All right. But then we get into molded blocks. And years ago, the molded bait block looked like it came out of a cupcake cookie sheet. They were huge. And they were filled with wax. Maybe some rats fed upon them, but mice didn't really go near it. Well, now the industry then gives you the mini extruded block, which is pretty much the staple of today. A smaller block, maybe less paraffin in it, with extruded edges. Why? Because the mice go to the extruded edges. The rat will go just right to that block and have a ball with it. But then Leafitech gives you soft bait. Two products, First Strike and Resolve. For years, wasn't around. But once again, it's just another evolution. It's a new concept. And soft bait technology is proven to work. So here's our hard bait at Leaf Attack. And there's some history here. Because if you look at the yellow lids in the back, that's the Mackie product. And I meet folks every day that say, wow, when I first started in pest control, I used Mackie. Well, do you still do? Well, yeah, we do. But, you know, whether we like soft bait or whatever. But people grew up on the Mackey product, and it is still there today. It's bromodialone, single feed, anticoagulant. The active ingredient is invented by Leafitech. But that product has evolved because that product went through the pellet, the meal, the big block, the little block. There's also sewer blocks, and Mackey is still available today. Generation in the green lid, active ingredient is difethylone. Single feed anticoagulant invented by Leafitech in the mid-90s. So Leafitech says, look, got to come up with a more palatable bait. So technology at the time enables them to come up with a generation mini block and generation pellets. Whether it's a Mackie pellet or a generation pellet, these are the only two pelletized baits in our industry that are paraffinized. Paraffination means we're putting wax to that product. But we're doing that so that pellet withstands moisture. If you're going to introduce Mackey pellets or generation pellets to a burrow system to control rodents, the rat sees that pellet as a seed that has fallen from a tree. And instinctively, the rat brings that pellet deeper into the nest. Because that pellet is paraffinized, it pushes back on the moisture. Its integrity is intact. That's why the critter is going to chomp on it. That's why he's going to eat it, and he will die from it. But once again, now more evolution. You look at a Blue Max product. Generation is great. Well, now we need something to be mold resistant, to be weather resistant. That's Blue Max. Blue Max is the weatherproof, mold resistant cousin to, to generation. It does exactly what it's supposed to do. No tox. That's our non-toxic monitoring block. If 
anybody needs that for certain accounts, it's there and it works perfect. It's basically as palatable as a Mackie block, but no active ingredient. So now we have soft baits. I could probably do an hour just on soft bait, just on first strike and resolve. And I'm sure there's some folks here live that might stand up and talk a little bit success stories on first strike and resolve. There's probably folks on the webinar that'll do the same thing. You have to understand first strike comes out first. The active ingredient is difethylone, the same active that we have in Generation and Bluemax. You've got a 10 gram placement with a little sachet, a little paper. What's in that product are fat oils, food grade fat oils with an active ingredient, some grain, and a little bitrex to spice things up. So it's almost like you're making a pate. You're creating something soft, pliable, but extremely tasty. We all like to eat fat from time to time, and that's what's the key to that product. First strike was out first, like I said, but now Resolve came out. Different active ingredient, bromodialone. But understand, the two soft baits, they taste entirely different to the rodent. There are two different flavor profiles. Different actives, they're both single feed anticoagulants. You could think First Strike is your steak, and you could look at Resolve as your lobster. So if you're a surf and turf kind of person, that's what you're looking at. Now we've also come out with a 40 gram placement. Four times as big. Whether it's First Strike or Resolve, it's available in a 40 gram placement. If I put food on a table and you come down here and you start feeding, that's great. But the more food I put out, the more enticed you get. If you start putting 40 gram placements out to attract rodents to feed, you will entice them. If anybody likes to supersize, if you want to go from a cheeseburger to a double to a triple to a quarter pound or whatever, that's the concept. You're putting more out. More out means more attractability, more palatability. They don't turn it down. When we launched the 40 gram sizes, we call them the red lids. And we included the SST, soft secure technology from Leafitech. It's a grill. It's just another way to secure and anchor the rodenticide in a bait station. The SST, the grill, will fit in pretty much anybody's rat stations, rodent stations. It doesn't have to just go in an Aegis system. But if you don't want to use horizontal and vertical rods, you can use the SST. And it'll cradle the soft bait right on top. It'll cradle a mini block. It'll cradle a place pack but it'll also keep the product higher and drier in a bait station. Also understand with the soft baits, on the label, it allows you to remove the paper. Whether it's 10 gram, 12 gram on Resolve, or 40 gram size, if you would like, you can remove the paper and put the paper in the trash. It says it right there on the label. So then if you want, you could just deal with soft bait without the paper sachet. But also understand the way a rodent behaves, they like the paper the paper is also attractive to them. And you, you could even use that for different situations and use it as an attractive for rodents. So we want you, the folks here at Gillette and on the webinar to be the first to hear about some new products we'll be launching soon. Like I said before, we had the red lids, the 40 gram placement size for first strike or resolve. And for the past year, when you bought a bucket of red lids, you got 15 of those SSTs enclosed. Well, now you're going to get five, but that price is not going to change. It's going to bring it down a bit, and that's the whole idea. As a manufacturer, I'm not going to tell you what to buy it for. That's what our distributors are here for. They'll give you the best pricing always on any of our products, especially when it's the new products, the new red lips. Looks pretty. Come June 1st, you'll be able to get Resolve or First Strike in four-pound bags. These are basically good, durable Ziploc bags. You can open it. You can close it. There'll be a label on it. What you're going to do is, let's say you're doing a route. You want backpacks. Put the four-pound bag in a backpack. You don't want to give somebody 16 pounds of first strike to carry all the way up a high-rise building. Give them a couple of four-pound bags. So once again, it's just ease of use. Something to think about. But these will be available as of June 1st. And according to Corporate Leaf Tech, the price will not change. It'll be good price right in line with everything else we're selling. So in summary, we've talked about the importance of doing a thorough inspection prior to baiting and the obvious and not so obvious types of resistance. Finally, we showed you some great Leaf and Tech products that can help you in being a pest management professional. 
So for me up here, I thank you for the time. I thank you for the support. Thank you for coming. What I'll do now is pass it back to Jermaine, and we'll go into the next part of our program. Thank you. Move some of this stuff. I don't worry about it. All I could say is, wow. I didn't know there was seven this much in um, killing rats and mice. Man, I'll tell you what, it, it was very interesting. So uh, once again, thank you to John and Ted. I know you guys probably know about this stuff, but I felt like, man, maybe I could kill some rodents now. But I'll leave it to the professionals. You know, it's not my job. Ask me to catch a football, that's a different story. So <laughs> uh, once again, thank you, uh, John and Ted. Uh, that was some great info. Uh, before we dive into the Q&A, I want to give away a $100 gift card to a lucky person on the webinar now. Send an email to the address on the screen. The 25th email will win a $100 gift card. We will announce the winner after the Q&A. Uh, next is the Q&A. We'll take some questions from the audience we have here in Foxborough at our lovely Gillette Stadium and everybody else online. I know... You guys can't be here, so a little bit jealous. So submit your questions through the chat function um, if you are on the webinar. So we'll, we will do that, and then um, I guess we'll answer some of those questions. So uh, do we have any questions? Oh, we got some questions coming up. I guess I'm going to ask the questions. There we go. See if he knows how to pronounce that. Uh, no, I probably don't know how to pronounce that. So. All right, so here's, here's the first question. Now, uh, I guess you guys can answer it. Uh, out of the four types of resistant uh, mentioned, uh, which do you think is the biggest issue today and why? Um, as far as I'm concerned, oh, microphone. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So we can see a little bit. <clears throat> yeah, as, as far as I'm concerned, the biggest, uh, the biggest one I run into is that behavioral resistance where you've got some critters that just don't like a particular product and you keep giving them that product and they don't eat anything and and uh, nothing's happening um, if you don't if you don't have a plan B in your back pocket uh, quite often those problems can get out of hand real quickly uh, and there's some behavioral resistance that happens with uh, uh, some of the single feed non anticoagulants that can uh, can trigger a problem when when uh, especially uh, bromethalin. You know, if, you, if you've put out a bromethalin bait uh, and you get a critter that gets into that stuff and doesn't get uh, a lethal dose, just gets enough to make him sick, uh, he will remember that um, and never go back to it again. Now, that is not a genetic change. That's a learned response, so that can't be, be forwarded. But rodents also have ways that they, they uh, show their offspring uh, about food. And one of the things that might happen in that situation is if that's a female and she's got her young and she now takes them past your bait station, she doesn't say don't go in there, that's bad stuff, you know, but she, she takes them to a good food source. And in the process, you end up with a problem that just keeps getting worse. And we see that a lot in, uh, their, in the, on the ag side of the business where they use a lot of bromethalin and you get these populations that rebound after they knock them down uh, with those single feed products, those acute toxicants. All right, good job. All right. This next one is, um, how much soft bait should I use at an infestation? Go ahead, John. A lot. <laughs> <laughs> once, once again, understand that you're going to keep an uninterrupted supply of bait. And if that infestation is a major infestation, you're going to keep feeding them. Uh, as an example, a technician at one time was filling about 20 bait stations a day with first strike and he was doing this for about two weeks and he would call me every morning at this account and he say John they keep eating it they're eating it good that's good keep filling them up and every day he went back to that account it was around the second second week and a half into that he called me and he was all nervous nothing's eaten they stopped eating it all right do you still see any rats no come to think of it there are no rats because they're dead and that's it. 
you cannot just gauge it and say, I've got this one account, I'm going to put a half a pound or I'm going to put 10 packs. The inspection is important. That's the whole idea of looking high and low, thinking three-dimensionally. Where are the runways? And how much product can I put out? Same thing with snap traps and glue boards. If you think you're going to put out 24 snap traps, maybe you should put out 48. And you might put 24 snap traps with food on it. Oh, wow, look, peanut butter, chocolate. But I only caught two. I only caught three. Well, did you ever think of using some nesting material? And see how many you catch with nesting material. Because maybe now you will catch mama mouse or mama rat. Because she's not hungry, but she loves nesting material. So change the game. But when it comes to what we're doing here, if we're going to hit them hard, we bring it all out at once. We bring it. We bring the fight to them. And you put as much out as you can to quit it, to end it, and put the fire out as quick as possible. Yeah, and I'll just add to that. That's one thing that we've, we've learned with, uh, with First Strike and now Resolve is uh, um, people are taken aback by how much bait they, they, the, the critters will eat and how quickly they'll eat it. And they, 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 you know, they don't know how to react to that. They're, they're so used to a wax block and a little nibble here and a little nibble there that all of a sudden when a bait station's empty, they, you know, it just blows their mind. And the other thing on the nesting material thing, I've been doing a little bit of putzing around with that lately. And uh, I've had some pretty good luck lately with terry cloth, tearing up an old bath towel and, and putting little strips or little patches of terry cloth. You know, we've all heard the thing about the string and the yarn and, and that sort of stuff, but the terry cloth thing has been working, especially for roof rats. And I don't know how much of a problem, I don't think it's a problem here at all, but, um, uh, you know, these, these critters are, the females are looking for something for, uh, for that nesting. Okay, I guess we've got... Yeah, we got... So here's okay. the next question. Uh, if I sailed up a house from top to bottom, but they are still getting in, what should I do? Oh, boy. <laughs> okay. Um, well, there's, there's two things to keep in mind here. Number one, make sure they're still getting in, okay, that they're not someplace in the building uh, reproducing in some out of the way, especially mice. You know, mice can be at some far away corner of the structure and... Um, you see an occasional one. I had a, a fast food restaurant in Ohio that uh, they, they were just fighting this problem from the outside in. They had this building sealed up. They had catch-alls on uh, all over the floor in the, in the kitchen and, and uh, uh, the back storage rooms and stuff. And this was going on and on and on over months. One here, one there, and they're, they're, they're plugging everything up. They're, or they had everything plugged up. And what it turned out to be was at the far corner of the dining room, in this fast food restaurant, they had a population of mice who were living up in the ceiling. And what happens with uh, with rodents, they're colonial critters, so you will have uh, this colony, and the weaker animals get pushed out by the stronger animals. And those weaker animals go looking for a place to, to live. And they pop up in the kitchen, and the the, the, the adult, and the stronger animals, the, the dominant animals, were actually, these were mice, we're actually uh, living off of the uh, the grease that accumulated on the the, ex the the exhaust hoods up in the kitchen. So they were never even coming down for food. They were just uh, living off of grease, and, and and in some cases they were actually coming down through the wall and getting into some garbage and stuff behind the fryers. They were never seen. But um, the the big thing is make sure that what you're you're confronted with is is not actually an infestation that's bubbling someplace in a hidden place in the in the facility. All right, this next question. I'm going to say yes to this one. Can soft bait be used outside? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, soft bait can you be used outside. Uh, First Strike or Resolve can be used outside. And as folks up in Canada, um, you might be listening, so we'll talk about that maybe in April when I get back up there. But folks in the U.S., yes, of course. First Strike and Resolve you can use outside winter, spring, summer, fall. Um, understand that when it gets cold, that soft bait might get a little stiff. And then folks will say, wow, it's a little stiff, but I also see these white specks in it. Well, understand the white specks, that's the fat. Go home and take a little jar of olive oil or vegetable oil and put it in your freezer. Next day, see what happens. The fat oil turns white. It gets stiff and solid. So when you see those white specks in a cold piece of soft bait, it's the fat, and we want the fat there. And that rodent's going to feed on it now, even if it's stiff. Just think about if you took a mini block and you rubbed grease all over it. That's exactly what's happening to a colder piece of soft bait. Uh, 
Right. I, I said yes because when you were doing the first strike soft thing, I remember saying it confused outside. You listen. Yeah, I did listen. Yeah, yeah I did listen. <laughs> I had a coach one time tell me, hey, the more you listen, the more you'll do. All right. There you go. It's in this building somewhere. Somewhere. <laughs> All right, here we go. Here's the next one. How many borough entrances exits do Rollins typically establish? Let's um Let's restrict this one to Norway rats. Uh, they're the, the biggest burrowing animal. In general, they're going to have their, their primary entrance and at least one bolt hole, at least one emergency exit. Um, quite often, there will be two or three. But uh, there's always, uh, well, I should, I, I should never use absolutes with rodents, but um, there's usually that, uh, that one main hole and that one bolt hole. Uh, and quite often, the bolt hole is going to be very tiny and uh, it will, uh, it's basically, an un, uh, you know, it's not fully finished. Uh, when they need to get out, they can break through the last, uh, you know, inch or two of topsoil before they have to get out. All right. That is one. Where is the best place to install a trail camera, and how long should it stay there? Well, that's going to going to depend on the, the situation that you're con confronted with. But um, uh, I was in a place uh, yesterday, day before yesterday, um, where this this uh, restaurant is fighting a rat infest infestation, and they've got both roof rats and Norway rats. Uh, this is down in North Carolina. They've got both roof rats and Norway rats in this restaurant. Not big numbers, but it's just a nagging chronic problem. And we found a, a number of places outside. There's one place behind the restaurant that we, it was such a narrow gap between this restaurant and the, uh, the one behind it that you can't get, get back there. There's only about 10 inches of clearance. So I suggested trail cameras on both. And by the way, there's a pile of debris in that, that gap that you can't get to. So I suggested trail cameras at both ends of that for maybe a week to just kind of keep, make sure that there's nothing running around in there. They also had a dirt crawl space under one quarter of this building, um, and it's only about 12 or 14 inches high, um, and, and there's pipes running through it and everything, and it's a hundred, hundred and some year old building. And uh, I could see tracks in the dust. I could see tr tail drags in the dust. So I knew the rats were running around in there at one point, but I didn't know if they were still running around in there. So we're putting uh, cameras. There's actually four openings into that crawl space. And we'll put cameras in one or two of those openings uh, to, uh, to, to keep an eye on it to see if there's anything still moving in there. Another place for trail cameras really come in handy is up in these suspended ceilings uh, where you don't know if there's something moving. And you can, you know, the, the, the trail camera, John, could you hand me that? The, the, the trail camera will have uh, an adjustment on it. Um, and the guys on the, the web won't be able to see this, but there's a little adjustment on the front that can change it from a narrow focus to a wide angle focus so that uh, as something moves into the territory, uh, you know, you can pick up stuff from uh, further to the sides. Uh, so the, I guess the short answer to that question is you, you set it to where you think they're moving. And if you've got some sort of an indication like a little rub mark or a track or something, and you're trying to confirm what's, what's happening, just aim it at it. And this camera sitting like this will probably be able to, uh, uh, to see the gentleman here in the black sweater and probably the gentleman over here in the, I think it's a blue shirt. Um, I'm colorblind, so I'm guessing. <laughs> um, and then beyond that, uh, by the time I get back to the gentleman back here with the plaid shirt, uh, all I'm going to see are the eyes glowing in that infrared, but all the rest of this should be pretty well uh, illuminated right down here in front. So, you know, we're looking at uh, well, probably a distance of 10 to 15 feet wide and 10 to 15 feet deep. All right, good job. I got one question, make it really quick. What's the biggest rat you ever seen? Because I know growing up in East Boston, uh, right on the harbor there, like down Maverick, kind of some of the project areas, right on the, the uh, yeah, they have, I like, water, like, sore giant, we call them ghetto rats, but they looked like small dogs. So what's the biggest rat you've ever seen? I think uh, John and I both would probably have to agree that the biggest rat we've ever seen is probably a little over a pound, maybe. Um, 
those big rat, there's, there's several things that, that enter into that big rat myth. The first thing is quite often when, when somebody sees these animals, first of all, prop, uh, I got to be careful what I say here because he's an awful big guy. <laughs> and now he's getting closer. No, you're fine. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Um, quite, people, people, a lot of people are just afraid of the things, okay? So they just, in their mind, they pick up some size. Quite often that rat will be uh, lighted against a wall. Okay, so there's a little shadow behind them, so it looks bigger that way. Uh, they also have the ability to kind of fluff themselves up a little bit, uh, make their fur stand up a little bit, so they look a little bit bigger. Uh, there was a, a contest, oh God, back 35 years ago, where uh, somebody, and I don't remember who it was anymore, put up a reward, you know, thousands of dollars for anybody who could bring in a two-pound rat. And that reward stood for years before they finally gave up on it. Um, the other thing that I encounter all the time, well, I'm encountering quite often now, is uh, first of all, uh, possums are often mistaken for a rat. And now we're finding that quite a few people have turned a whole bunch of Gambian pouched rats loose. Um, I, there's probably not a month goes by now that I don't get a picture from somebody of this, this rat that's the size of a possum. And it really is a rat. But they, they get these animals for pets and when they when they when, when they become adults they get mean and they bite and uh, they can inflict a disease through that bite so that what they do rather than, than kill the thing is they take it outside and let it go and and people send me pictures of a gambian pouch rat running up a tree in in new york hmm. you know kansas I've, uh, they've, it's happened several times out there oh i didn't know that i and I, I always noticed that there were a lot of skunks in east boston and somebody told me a long time yeah. ago that they would bring skunks in to, to deal with the rat population. And I don't know how true that is, but yeah, it could be alive. Yeah, yeah, it could be alive. Maybe we just have a lot of skunks there. Um, that, 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 you know, that was some really good stuff. Uh, now we got the winners here. We got the winner for the one hundred dollar gift card, and that winner is uh, the twenty fifth email webinar is Vance Walker, and that's I think it's uh, McConley Services. Is that how you say it? Vance Walker, so congratulations to him. Just won a $100 gift card. Um, before the webinar, we drew uh, a winner from our live audience to get the Patriot Pack. Uh, that winner is, we know he was taking his time in the bathroom. We had to wait on him, but now we are going to make it official. Don Ravad uh, is the winner. Is, is Say Ravad, is that how it said? Reward. Well, don't mess with him. He's yeah. No, 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 no. I, I'm a Bruins fan, so you know. <laughs> when you say Canada, it's kind of like you know. Yeah. But congratulations on that. <laughs> um, uh, also, uh, Leaf Leafa Tech is contributing twenty five dollars to a charity for each person who attended the meeting, whether online or in person. As as a result. Leafa Tech is contributing, now get this is pretty good, seven uh seventy five hundred dollars uh to uh different charities today. So good job, Leafa Tech. Okay. So we are about to kind of wrap things up. Again, I want to thank Ted and John. I also uh, want to thank you all for attending in person and on the webinar. We appreciate your support and how you will increase your usage of LeafaTech products.